choice. So can I ask the First Minister what progress has she made in achieving this? First Minister. We continue to ensure that pupils have the widest possible choice. Of course, uh, the system has changed over the last few years, so uh, we now assess the qualifications of young people at the stage they leave school. And when we look at pupil attainment uh, at the point pupils leave school, we find two things I would hope Ruth Davidson and everybody else across this chamber would welcome. Firstly, we find that attainment overall is up in Scotland. And secondly, we find that the gap between the richest and the poorest is narrowing. Uh, that's what matters, and that's where real progress is being made. Ruth Davidson. I'm not sure that was much of a progress report on school choice, so let's take the progress that was presented to this parliament yesterday. Professor Jim Scott appeared before the Education Committee, uh, and he talked of the staggering drop in subject choice that we're seeing in our schools following the introduction of curriculum for excellence. Now, more than half of Scottish schools restrict pupils to just six exam courses in S4. And here's the impact. Over the last five years, these restricted choices brought in under this SNP government have cost Scottish pupils 622,000 qualifications. That's 622,000 courses that would have been sat but never were. Now, Harder, Professor please. Scott, who is a former head of 18 years standing, so those shouting from a sedentary position might want to listen to what he had to say yesterday, he said this, I actually struggle to say that in a public forum. It is almost unbelievable. I think so too. What does the First Minister make of it? First Minister. I, I think it's entirely unbelievable, actually. Um, Unfortunately for Ruth Davidson, I've looked rather closely uh, and with interest at Professor Scott's research. Uh, and the problem is when you try to compare the old and the new systems, it's a bit like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, Professor Scott, and it, it might do Ruth Davidson well to, to listen to some of this. Professor Scott focused on awards below higher level. That's essentially looking at what pupils achieve by the time they finish S4. But you know, the days of large numbers of pupils leaving school at S4 are long gone. The overwhelming majority Absolutely. stay on to S5 and S6. So we focus on the awards pupils achieve by the time they leave school. For a young person, that's what matters to their chances of getting an apprenticeship, a college place, a university place or a job. And when you look at that, we see attainment overall is up and the gap between the richest and the poorest is narrowing. So here's some figures uh, for Ruth Davidson to chew over. Uh, the proportion of pupils getting passes at higher level has risen more than 10 percentage points. It was 50.4% uh, 50 in 2009-10. In 2016-17, it was 61.2%. When we look at National 5 level, the proportion leaving school with an award had risen 9 percentage points. It was 77.1% in 2009-10. It was 86.1% in 2016-17. Uh, and at higher level, the gap between the rich and the poorest has fallen by almost 7 percentage points. And here's one uh, last statistic that I think should interest people uh, right across this chamber. It comes from Maureen McKenna, the director of education in Glasgow. She points out that in Drumchapel High School, uh, I think recognised as one of our more deprived areas, in 2006, 8% of pupils achieved one or more higher by the end of S5. In 2018, that was 53%. 8% to 53%. You know, I think it's about time. Ruth Davidson stopped talking our schools down and started celebrating the achievements of pupils right across this country. Ruth Davidson. I can tell the First Minister doesn't want to talk about that 622,000 figure. In fact, she'd rather talk about anything else. And I think I heard her at the beginning as she was rising saying that she didn't believe it. But let me go back to the actual transcript that was presented to the committee yesterday. If things had gone on as they were in 2013, we would have had an extra 622,000 qualifications in Scotland in the five years since. That is the analysis. And it's not just about those 622,000 qualifications that were lost. It is also about the drop in subject choice and where it's hitting pupils the hardest. So let's talk about schools in deprived areas, shall we? Because the schools which are most likely to drop down to as few as 
five subjects in S4, leaving pupils with little room to pursue a rounded education, are in these deprived areas. Let's listen to Dr Marina Shapira of Stirling University, who also gave evidence yesterday. She said yet this, the reduction in subject choice is larger in schools in higher areas of deprivation, and the reduction is larger in schools where there are more children on free school meals. If we're going to sort the problem, we need to accept the evidence. Will the First Minister accept the evidence from Dr Marina Shapira? Well, First Minister. Let me offer some more evidence from the Director of Education in Glasgow City Council. She said, and she said it just this week, in 2008, just 5% achieved five or more hires by the end of S5. In 2018, that had increased to what she described as an incredible 13.4%, an increase of 178%. She points uh, to another school in Glasgow, St Thomas Aquinas Secondary School, uh, where in 2006, 29% uh, achieved uh, more than one higher by the end of S5. In 2018, that was up to 65%. Wow. So all of the statistics are pointing in the same direction. And I'm not sure... If Ruth Davidson is standing here today saying that somehow that doesn't matter, the proportion of pupils getting passes at higher level, just let me repeat, has risen by more than 10 percentage points. Uh, it's risen by 9 percentage points for those getting uh, a qualification at National 5 uh, level. We also see over 50,000 skill-based qualifications, awards and certificates have been achieved this year, which incidentally is double the figure of yep. skill-based qualifications that were achieved in 2012. Uh, and just for added measure, uh, presiding officer, talking about closing the attainment gap, uh, just this morning, UCAS has released new data showing that Scotland has hit another new record for the number of young people getting a university place. So let's start celebrating that success. Uh, and lastly, presiding officer, uh, I don't think the Tories have got a shred of credibility on education left after the U-turn they did yesterday voting to scrap primary one assessments that they have spent the last four years demanding that this Scottish Government introduce zero credibility for Ruth Davidson. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister can ball and shout the odds all she wants, but there are legitimate questions to be asked about education under her watch, and I will continue to ask them. And what I don't understand, presiding officer, is that in May, the First Minister accepted that the drop in subject choice needed addressed. I read out her answer just a few months ago. Today, she's saying that to have half of schools offering only six courses at S4 seems absolutely fine. But the point here is that the crash in subject choice that we're now seeing is a symptom of a wider malaise, and it is caused by the chaotic introduction of curriculum for excellence. Under this government, we have seen reduced subject choice, we have seen teachers left in the dark, we have seen a higher pass rate falling, we have seen attainment in national exams down by a third compared to the old standard grades, and yet on education this government shows no sign of listening to the evidence, of listening to this parliament or of listening to parents or to teachers. And more must be done before damage is exceeded. So the solution is a complete overhaul of curriculum for excellence. And for once, will this government listen? First Minister. Well, if Ruth Davidson doesn't like me shouting out the evidence, let me repeat it a, a bit more quietly for her. The proportion of pupils getting passes at higher level has increased. Uh, the proportion of pupils getting passes at National 5 level has increased. The numbers of skill-based qualifications being achieved by our young people in schools has doubled since 2012, and we've got a record number of young people uh, going to university. That sounds to me like success that this government is determined to build on. Now turn to Curriculum for Excellence. Curriculum for Excellence has just been lauded and praised uh, by the International Council of Education uh, advisors uh, and Ruth Davidson week after week almost stands up here demanding more information on the performance of pupils in schools and yet yesterday she and her party performed uh, a breathtaking U-turn and voted against assessments in primary one that she called for demanded in her manifesto and has demanded at regular intervals since then. Uh, Ruth Davidson, on issues of education, is a shameless opportunist. Uh, I will leave her to the political opportunism, and I, the Deputy First Minister, and this entire government 
will go on with delivering for the interests of pupils right across this country. And I think the people of Scotland will notice the difference. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, this government appears to still believe that without the standardised testing of five-year-olds, teachers will not be able to assess our children's learning needs. Scotland's teachers profoundly disagree. Why does the First Minister believe that she knows more about teaching Scotland's school children than Scotland's school teachers? First Minister. Well, I continue to believe that if we set a benchmark for what we think uh, children in primary one should be achieving in education, uh, then we have a duty to those children, to their parents uh, and to wider society to be able to know whether those children are achieving those benchmarks or not. Uh, that is judged by, by the judgment of teachers, but I think it is right that that is informed uh, by the standardised assessments that we have been uh, talking about. I continue uh, to take that view. As the Deputy First Minister said uh, yesterday, he and we will reflect on Parliament's uh, judgment uh, yesterday and we will come back with a statement in due course. Uh, but I think there is a mix of opinions uh, amongst uh, teachers. I mean, let me read out, for example, the opinion of Lindsay Watt, who is a former head teacher at Castleview Primary School in Edinburgh, the winner of the Robert Owen Award, which recognises inspirational uh, educators. Uh, that teacher said this, as a teacher of almost 40 years experience, 25 as a head teacher, I'm confused as to why there has been such a furore over primary one pupils undertaking uh, standardised assessments. Various forms of standardised assessments in primary one have been used for many years. The new format is an attempt to unify uh, the process. Uh, they provide an opportunity for schools to access robust additional assessment, providing valuable information to parents about their child's learning journey. I think that is important. I think the opinions of all teachers are important. Uh, but I'm determined that we do raise standards and we close the attainment gap. And the more information we've got to help us to do that, the better. That's my view, and it's a very strong view that I hold. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, last night, this parliament voted decisively to scrap primary one tests. We have a first minister who talks a lot about the will of parliament when it is in the interests of her party. I hope that the first minister will listen to the will of parliament when it is in the interests of Scotland's children. Teachers say, teachers say that these tests are a waste of time. But the, but the government says, but the government says, and we've just heard it again, that it will carry on regardless. The First Minister always accuses others of talking Scotland down. I only wish that she would stop talking down to Scotland's teachers and start valuing them. This week, Scotland's teachers have rejected the government's latest pay offer. If the First Minister won't listen to teachers on primary one testing, will she listen to them on pay? First Minister. Well, we will continue to negotiate uh, on pay through the standard processes. I, I think that is what we would be expected to do and is uh, rightly what we will do. Uh, going back to standardised assessments, I mean, interestingly, Richard Leonard is, is quite selective when it comes to respecting the will uh, of the Scottish Parliament. But, but, but let us focus. Well, let us focus for just a moment, shall we, on the will of the people in an election. In the 2016 election, to this parliament, two-thirds of voters who voted in that election voted for manifestos that contained a commitment to standardised assessment in primary one. Now, I don't know whether Richard Leonard thinks that should just be cast aside, uh, but I don't think that should be cast aside. So we will reflect on what uh, Parliament said yesterday, and then we will make a judgment based on what we think is right for the interests of young people across Scotland. Uh, our consideration will not be party political opportunism. Our consideration will be the best interests of pupils in Scottish classrooms. Richard Leonard. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon says that education is the driving and defining priority of her government. It's her record on education that she says she wants to be judged by. So let's look at the record. £400 million cut from school budgets, a testing policy in tatters, a flagship education bill ditched, 
Scotland's teachers on the verge of strike action. First Minister, if education really is the top priority, why is the government's educational policy in such a mess? First Minister. Well, I'm delighted to be able to share all of this information again with the Chamber. Uh, there are a higher proportion of pupils passing exams in Scotland. More pupils getting hires. More pupils getting National 5 qualifications. More pupils getting skills-based qualifications. The gap between the rich and poor pupils closing. Uh, more young people, including young people from our deprived areas, going to university. I think that is success, and it's success that we are determined to build on. Uh, I have said, and I will say again, that education is our top priority, and we want to be judged on that. But you know what? To be judged on that, it's important to have the information that tells Parliament and tells Scotland whether we are succeeding or not. We've got the information when it comes to exam passes. I want to have that information from the early stages of primary school so that we know we are not letting young people down. We simply should not leave it too late to act and to intervene if young people need extra help. That's why we think assessments in primary one are the right thing to do. And two-thirds of the people who voted in the last election agreed with that. And I think that is rather important. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. The West Lothian Courier recently reported on the plight of the Mackenzie family from Breach in the more rural part of my constituency. The family attended St John's Hospital with their sick baby and were transferred eventually after a three-hour wait for an ambulance to the Royal Hospital for sick children because, because the children's ward at St John's remains closed to inpatients. The baby was discharged at 8 p 11 p.m. and the family were then left to walk into the city centre to catch the last bus to Livingston to then get a taxi home to Breach, arriving at 1.30 a.m. in the morning. All of course contrary to the commitments made by NHS Lothian to provide transport support uh, to local families. So, First Minister, given that baby Kenzie is one of 788 West Lothian children to be transferred from St John's to the sick kids, uh, how will you and the government ensure that NHS Lothian and crucially the Paediatrics Programme Board do absolutely everything and more to return our much-loved and first-class children's ward to a 24-7 service as soon as possible? First Minister. Well, I can assure Angela Constance that the go government will work uh, closely with NHS Lothian to ensure uh, that the ward is reopened as quickly as possible. The acting chief executive of NHS Lothian uh, assured uh, Jean Freeman on uh, the 28th of August that all efforts are being made to recruit uh, medical staff and advanced enough practitioners to reinstate the inpatient unit. Uh, the current situation, of course, is uh, related to ensuring patient safety, and I don't think any member uh, of this parliament would responsibly suggest uh, that patient safety should not be uh, paramount. Uh, I will ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health to look into the specific case that Angela Constance has raised and keep her and other members with an interest updated on progress in getting the inpatient unit reopened as quickly as possible. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, uh, a full-blown crisis for Shetland's aquaculture and shellfish sectors was only averted at the 11th hour by Northlink's ability to charter an extra freight vessel allowing vital time-sensitive shipments to be made. This is also, though, a critical period for Orkney's livestock sector, looking to ship most of its uh, cattle and sheep to the Scottish mainland. As Malcolm Scott from Orkney March said to me earlier today, had Northlink not secured the arrow, the potential consequences for farming in Orkney would have been disastrous. Does the First Minister accept that meeting the growing freight needs of linchpin industries in Orkney and Shetland now requires access to a third freight vessel on an ongoing basis? And will she ask her Transport Minister to look seriously and urgently at proposals that have already been made that could increase freight capacity, not just on the Northern Isles routes, but also on West Coast routes, and freeing up potential additional space for passenger traffic as well? First Minister. Can I thank Liam MacArthur for raising what is an important issue? Uh, yes, I, I do understand uh, the demands that uh, are being made for increased freight capacity. I will certainly ask the Transport uh, Minister to look at the proposals that have been made to brief me on uh, his views on those and uh, to correspond with Liam MacArthur about the way forward. But uh, I'm grateful to him for raising uh, the issue and the Transport Secretary will revert to him as soon as possible. 
Anas Sarwar. Presenting officer, this week we learnt of the third contamination effect in the cancer ward at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in a short space of time. This has affected drinking water, washing facilities, patients being prescribed antibiotics who are already immunocompromised, patients being transferred to local hospices to get a wash or having to go home, and treatments being delayed. One angry and distressed parent, Donna Louise Hurrell, contacted me directly and she told me that her daughter has now had her chemotherapy delayed on three separate occasions. She asked me to ask directly how many cases of chemotherapy have been delayed due to bacterial and safety concerns affecting the hospital. Can the First Minister please address this directly, but also ask the Cabinet Secretary to instigate an urgent investigation of that hospital to give full answers and full transparency in the interest of those patients, their families and also the wider community and to guarantee that we can minimise the risk of this ever happening again. First Minister. Well, this situation is deeply regrettable. In terms of uh, the question about numbers of cases, I don't have that information to hand, but I will undertake uh, to ensure that that information is provided to Anna Sarwar. Uh, the primary concern here of the Health Board and indeed of the Scottish Government is the safety and well-being of children and their families at the hospital. Uh, we are aware of the new cases that have been linked to this incident and uh, families involved have been kept fully informed and it's right that that uh, continues to happen. Uh, we are liaising closely uh, at the moment with Health Protection Scotland, Health Facilities Scotland. Both of those organisations are supporting NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to ensure that all appropriate steps are in place to manage uh, this incident. While uh, no patients with bacterial infections uh, are currently given cause for concern, it's very important that all precautions are taken to prevent any further infections. So I will undertake to provide the information that Anna Sarwar asked for, but also ask the Health Secretary to keep, keep him and the Chamber updated on this situation. Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the issues at Air Station Hotel and the severe disruption to rail services south of Air, which is pushing even more traffic onto the already overloaded A77. I wonder if uh, she and her government are aware that there are now plans to close the A77 several times over the next few weeks for urgent resurfacing works, which actually will in effect cut off the South West. Although we don't want the postponement of these surfacing works in the A77 given its appalling state of disrepair, but surely there must be a better plan than this which takes into account the travel needs of the population in the South West, which includes the replacement bus service and the huge volume of freight traffic using that road. First Minister. Uh, well, I un understand the difficulties that are being posed by the situation at uh, Air Station. Uh, if the member is saying he doesn't think that the resurfacing surfacing work should be postponed, obviously that limits uh, the options. But of course, Transport Scotland and others involved here have to look closely at these decisions to make sure that disruption is being minimised. I know the Transport Secretary will uh, be taking a very close interest in this and I'll happily ask him to correspond with uh, the member about this. We have uh, in previous weeks talked about the situation at Air Central. A uh, proposal was made uh, around car parking spaces, for example, at Presswick Airport, which has been taken forward and we will continue to do whatever we can uh, to minimise the disruption uh, that this situation is causing, including looking at some of the decisions around works to the A77. So uh, I hope that answer is helpful and uh, the Transport Secretary will be happy to provide further information. And Shona Robertson. Does the First Minister uh, share my serious concerns over reports that the UK Government is planning to renege on the Tay Cities deal as reported by the Courier newspaper earlier this week, which would see the UK Government reduce its contribution to the deal by a reported £80 million? So will the First Minister agree to raise this matter urgently with the UK Government to ensure that they deliver on their part of their, this crucial deal? First Minister. Cities and their regions play a crucial role in driving economic growth, which is why the Scottish Government is working individually and collectively with our cities, regions and the businesses and individuals within them to boost this growth. We know that all partners have invested a huge amount of work in their proposals for uh, the Tay City deal and delivering for the regional economy uh, and we continue to encourage the UK Government to match Scottish Government investment in the Tay Cities deal. Uh, the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to achieving a heads of term agreement as soon as possible. Uh, we are in a position to proceed right now uh, and the situation is that 
we are waiting for the UK government to confirm its position. Uh, I hope that happens soon and I hope the commitment uh, of the UK government is not diminished. Um, I had the privilege of attending the opening of the v &A last uh, Friday, transformational uh, for Dundee, and I think it would be a deep shame if that momentum couldn't continue uh, with the Tay Cities deal being resolved as quickly as possible. So the Scottish Government is ready to go. The question that remains to be answered is the UK Government going to stick to its commitment as well? I hope the answer to that is yes. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hope the First Minister is aware of revelations that have been published by the Ferret and the National that campaigners against fracking are amongst the peaceful, democratic campaigners labelled by Police Scotland as domestic extremists. We've known for years that environmental campaigners, along with peace activists and others, have in the past been spied on or infiltrated by police forces in the UK, including in Scotland. But this statement of current practice is shocking. Anti-fracking campaigners who exercise their democratic right to protest our heroes, yet Police Scotland is labelling them as domestic extremists. When did the First Minister or her Justice Secretary become aware of this, and what action has the Government taken to address it? First Minister. Firstly, I absolutely support the right of peaceful uh, democratic protest. I've taken part in my life in many, many peaceful democratic uh, protests, including uh, at FAS Lane against nuclear weapons. Uh, so I will defend uh, the right of people, whether they are protesting against fracking or nuclear weapons or any uh, other issue, as long as they do that peacefully and democratically, uh, then I absolutely defend the right to do so. It's, of course, for the police to answer for operational decisions that they take, but that is my view, uh, and I'm very happy to state that view unequivocally today. Patrick Harvey. I'm afraid we shouldn't accept that this is merely an operational matter. If individuals, campaign groups and communities cannot peacefully campaign on matters, that, issues that matter in our society without being labelled as domestic extremists, and this is the same category used to describe the threat posed by racist and fascist forces in our society, this strikes at the heart of the relationship between policing and the public, and that is clearly a political question. The First Minister mentions Faz Lane. This weekend, I'll be joining members of my party, as well as those in the SNP, I'm sure in, in Labour, and many others as well, at Faz Lane, again to protest the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Scotland, just as people have worked across party lines to oppose blood sports, environmental destruction, asylum evictions, and more. The right to do so freely is fundamental to a democratic society. Can the First Minister give an assurance that campaigners at Faz Lane on Saturday will not be designated as domestic extremists merely for attending a peaceful rally? First Minister. Let me give uh, my view. I think if I was to start uh, in this chamber speaking on behalf of Police Scotland, there would be all sorts of, of justifiable, justifiable and legitimate criticisms of me for doing so. However, I am uh, very happy to ask the Chief Constable to address uh, the point uh, on behalf of P Police Scotland that Patrick Harvey has raised. But going back to my view, I do not consider uh, people who protest against nuclear weapons or fracking or anything else in a peaceful and democratic way to be extremists uh, in any sense and would not uh, expect anybody to consider them to be extremists. Patrick Harvey is absolutely right uh, that peaceful protest is a fundamental part of uh, democracy. People should have the right to protest uh, as long as they do so uh, peacefully. Uh, that applies to people who will be at Faz Lane uh, on Saturday. I wish them uh, well. I look forward to the day when there are not uh, nuclear weapons on Scottish soil at Faz Lane and the sooner uh, that day arrives uh, the better. So that applies to people uh, campaigning and protesting against nuclear weapons. It applies to people campaigning or protesting against fracking or any other issue. So that is my very, very firm view, and it's one that I hope will have the support of people right across this chamber. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Can I congratulate the First Minister for being so bold and radical this morning? She now wants to delay Brexit by a few weeks. That's definitely going to save us from colossal economic damage. <laughs> Despite going calls for a final say on the deal, the First Minister continues to dither. Does she not understand that we don't just need a delay to Brexit, we need to stop it dead in its tracks? First Minister. 
Well, firstly, I don't want Scotland to be dragged out of the EU against its will at all. I don't want it to happen in March. I don't want it to happen in April. I don't want it to happen at all. But nothing Willie Rennie has ever said on this issue would give Scotland a guarantee that in future we will not be dragged out of the EU against our will. But let me... Let me make an offer uh, to Willie Rennie, as somebody who supports the idea of a people's vote. I said again yesterday, uh, the SNP will not stand in the way of that. But if Willie Rennie wants me to be an enthusiastic advocate of that, then let him explain to me how that vote will guarantee that Scotland won't simply find itself in the same position that we find ourselves in in June 2016, where we vote to remain in the EU, but the rest of the UK votes to leave. So I make an offer to Willie Rennie. If he can explain right now how Scotland is guaranteed that it won't find itself in that position, then I'm happy to talk to him further about it. Willie Rennie. The First Minister should be preparing for victory, not defeat. And we'd have a better chance of winning the people's vote Order, if we had the Scottish Government on board. Order, please. Every, every day, every day the First Minister Dithers gives comfort to those who want a hard Brexit. Being neutral on a people's vote undermines the positive way out of this. Sadiq Khan supports it. Hundreds of Labour delegates want it. Former Conservative ministers back it. Even the Czech Republic and Malta are on board. And the last time I looked, they were small independent countries. Support is building. On Saturday, there's a People's Vote rally in Stirling. There will be an SNP speaker at that rally. Will he be backing the People's Vote campaign, telling them they're wrong, or dithering just like the First Minister? First Minister. Wow. Willie Rennie, well, failed to answer the question uh, that I posed, which I thought was quite yeah. notable. But Willie Rennie... Oh, Willie a, Rennie... Oh, dear. Order, Willie please. Rennie said Order, please. Keep it down. Be, Willie Rennie said we should be preparing for victory. Well, I campaigned for victory in the EU referendum in 2016, and I helped to secure a 62% vote to remain in the EU in 2016. And do you know what? It didn't count for anything because the rest of the UK voted to leave. Now, if I'm going to enthusiastically get behind the campaign for another EU vote, then surely it's not unreasonable to ask for guarantees that Scotland will not find itself in that position all over again. And the fact of the matter is, Willie Rennie and others campaigning for a people's vote are unable to give that guarantee. If they are prepared to give it, I'm happy to get behind uh, that campaign. But it seems to me right now that there is only one thing that can stop Scotland uh, having these decisions imposed on it against its will, and that is for Scotland to be independent. And maybe it's time Willie Rennie started to support that. Thank you. Thank you. We have some, some further supplementaries. The first from Finlay Carson. Thousands of my constituents in Galloway and Western Freeze face being bypassed by the digital revolution and be unable to access high-speed broadband services, according to Audit Scotland. Indeed, large parts of Scotland are unlikely to secure super-fast internet speeds by this government's deadline of 2021 with rural communities likely to be hit hardest. 376,000 households are still lacking high speeds, and more than 221,000, including many businesses, will not have access to the network before 2021. Can the First Minister give my constituents a promise that our government will publish a clear timetable for R100 by the summer of 2019, or... Will this yet again be an example of this SNP's government habit of making big announcements and then two or three years down the line failing to deliver? Would members please, would members please allow other members idea. to ask a question? First Minister. 
good idea for the member to have actually read the Audit Scotland report <laughs> before coming to this chamber uh, today. Let me give him uh, some snippets forward. Let me start actually with uh, what Fraser uh, McKinley from Audit Scotland said on uh, Good Morning Scotland uh, this very day. He said, and I'm quoting, the good news is that the Scottish Government has achieved its target to provide access to fibre broadband to 95% of homes and businesses across Scotland by the end of last year, and they did that well. Uh, or we could take page five of the report. Higher than expected take up and lower than expected costs mean uh, 60,300 additional premises will gain access to the fibre network at no extra cost to the public sector. Or page eight of the report, by the end of 2017, 95% of premises in Scotland had access to fibre broadband. Only around two thirds of premises in Scotland would have access without public sector investment. On the 100% commitment and let's uh, remember that that 100% commitment both in terms of coverage and broadband speeds will take us ahead of any other part of the UK. Fraser McKinley when asked this specific question uh, this morning said we are definitely not saying that won't be achieved by 2021. Uh, we are investing £600 million pounds in the R100 procurement uh, programme. The procurement will be let uh, next year. And just uh, as a final point, presiding officer, uh, the Scottish Government is uh, investing £600 million. Pounds. But despite this being a reserved matter, yeah. the UK yeah. Government is investing just £21 million. Pounds. A mere 3% of the total. So why don't you take it up with your own Tory colleagues in Westminster before you come lecturing the Scottish Government on a programme that we are delivering and according to Audit Scotland, delivering well. Officer, last night the Prime Minister told EU leaders she's put forward serious proposals on Brexit. But all that's on the table is a no deal or a blind Brexit, both of which would seriously damage Scotland's interests. Does the First Minister think that these are really serious proposals or just seriously misguided? First Minister. Well, Bre Brexit is a mistake and the handling of Brexit by the UK government is a complete and utter shambles. Uh, I mean, Chequers is, and I'm quoting, I think, a Tory MP uh, just this morning when I say this, Chequers is as dead as a dodo. Uh, and although the Prime Minister wants to frame the choice that's coming later this year as one between no deal and Chequers, it is increasingly likely that that choice is going to be between no deal uh, or a no detail deal, uh, where the, the future statement about the relationship after uh, Brexit has no detail, is vague, and nobody will know what comes after EU membership. And I think it would be reckless in the extreme uh, for the UK to take a step off the Brexit cliff edge, uh, effectively wearing a blindfold with no idea where it's going to land. In those circumstances, it would be far better and far more responsible to extend Article 50 so that all of the alternatives uh, can be uh, properly looked at. But I think it's long past the case where we can expect uh, sensible approaches from this uh, government. Uh, they are intent, uh, this UK Tory government is intent on recklessly uh, taking the whole country off the Brexit cliff edge. Uh, and I think future generations will judge them extremely harshly for that. And Jenny Mara. Can I add my voice to the calls to break the deadlock over the Tay Cities deal, presiding officer? The First Minister knows that as part of Dundee's regeneration and our superb new v &E, that the city is bidding for decommissioning work to create good jobs. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber why she will not publish the EY report which details why Dundee didn't get decommissioning investment in her programme for government so Dundee can better understand her government's analysis of this economic opportunity? First Minister. Well, I'll come back to it on the issue of the EY report. We remain uh, committed to securing jobs and decommissioning in a whole range uh, of other areas for uh, Dundee. I think uh, right now, uh, assuming the UK government stops dragging its feet over the Tay Cities deal, there is every reason to be really optimistic about the future uh, of Dundee. Of course, the Scottish Government was the principal funder uh, of the v and that I know she uh, attended the opening of on Friday as well. But of course, uh, we've also put the headquarters of the new Social Security Agency in Dundee, delivering hundreds of jobs in the city of Dundee. So this is a government, whether it's the Social Security Agency, whether it's uh, our support for the v and whether it's our continued support for jobs in a whole host of uh, other areas. This is a government that's full square behind Dundee and we will continue to be so. Question number five, Alistair Allen. 
to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will use the Social Metrics Commission's new framework for tackling poverty. First Minister. We welcome the work of the Social Metrics Commission to further develop our understanding of poverty. I note the Commission states that the UK Government political debate has focused on the measurement of poverty rather than the action needed to drive better outcomes, and it calls for, uh, I'm quoting, energy into creating pathways out of poverty. Of course, the opposite is the case for this Government, where we are committed uh, to action, having already set our statutory targets. Uh, of course, the UK Government have scrapped their child poverty targets, scrapped their poverty unit, and scrapped the Child Poverty Commission. Uh, they're also presiding over the disastrous rollout of universal credit and welfare cuts that will see more children pushed into poverty. Uh, this government, by contrast, is focused on actions that will reduce child poverty and tackle deep-seated inequalities. I thank the First Minister for that answer. On child poverty specifically, the report shows that Scotland does better in working to address this than the rest of the UK does. Isn't it the case, however, that while Scotland lacks full powers over employment laws and social security, we are tackling these problems with one hand tied behind our back in the face of even deeper cuts to welfare from a visibly uncaring UK government. Uh, yes, that is absolutely uh, right. While we work to try to lift children out of poverty, UK government welfare policy in particular is actively pushing families and children into poverty. You know, there are independent reports that show that more than one in three children could be living in poverty by 2030. That is squarely due to UK welfare cuts, which uh, by 2020 will amount to almost £4 billion a year for Scotland. Uh, while the UK government is ignoring child poverty, we're getting on with tackling inequalities and taking action to meet our child poverty targets. In March, we published Every Child, Every Chance, which is our four-year programme of action to reduce child poverty. Since then, we've announced the early introduction of Best Start grant payments, uh, the new minimum school clothing grant of £100, uh, all of which provides crucial help for parents. But there is no doubt whatsoever that with more powers over welfare, we could do so much more. And of course, an independent Scotland could do so much better. Question number six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update uh, on the Scottish breast screening programme in light of reports that many women were not contacted for their final checkup. First Minister. A, a review of the Scottish breast screening programme by the Scottish Clinical Task Force identified 1,761 women aged over 70 who were not invited for their final breast screening appointment. I can tell the Chamber that all of those women have now been sent a letter advising them of what has happened and offering an opportunity to attend for breast screening. All women affected who wish to have a breast screen will receive an appointment for screening before the end of October this year. Uh, we will ensure that any additional screening will not displace other women due for their screening appointment. Uh, work has also been taken forward to develop an IT fix to address this specific issue going forward. Arrangements are in place to manually identify any women who may have been missed for this reason until that IT fix is in place. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that update? Uh, but it does miss, miss a, a very crucial fact, and that's that this was actually predictable. Because in 2016, a review by Healthcare Improvement Scotland found that uh, nearly 4,000 women had not been sent screening invitations. And as a result, it made a number of recommendations, one of which was better oversight of that IT system. In May this year, the former Health Secretary told this chamber that and I quote, I want to reassure members of the public that this issue does not affect the NHS in Scotland and patients should be reassured that there are no problems with the programme records or the IT system. So can I ask the First Minister, why was the 2016 recommendation uh, ignored and what reassurances can she give today that the screening programme IT system is and will be fit for purpose? First well, firstly, in, in relation to the 2016 issue, my understanding is this is uh, a separate issue uh, and therefore I'm not sure it is accurate to say that this was, uh, to use uh, the word that was used, predictable. In terms of the situation around the English breast screening uh, programme, the former Health Secretary uh, sought and received assurances at that time that that issue was not being repeated in Scotland. However, Shona Robinson rightly requested further due diligence checks. The clinical task force was established to support Public Health England and identifying and contacting any woman affected who was now uh, living in Scotland. 
Uh, that task force also carried out a wider review and uh, the issue that we're talking about today was an unrelated and separate issue uh, and it was as a result of that issue that we discovered uh, that the 1,761 women uh, had not been invited for their final screening uh, appointment. Now, I would take this opportunity to apologise to each and every one of these uh, women. That should not have happened. Uh, but uh, I think it is important to put in context, although of course it, it doesn't reduce the anxiety for any of these individual women, but it is around 0.2% uh, of the approximately uh, 700,000 women who are eligible for breast screening in Scotland and invited every uh, three years. So it's because of the action that the previous Health Secretary took at the time of the announcement in England uh, that this issue came to light. As I said in my original answer, all women are now being offered appointments for screening uh, and an IT fix is being put in place to ensure uh, that this does not happen in the future. And I hope uh, that answer gives some comfort uh, to the women uh, who did miss their final screening appointment, but also uh, to the wider population of women uh, who go for breast screening. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll turn now to, or in a moment, to members' business in the name of Lee MacArthur on Scotland's marine energy industry. But we'll first of all have a short suspension to allow uh, members and members of the public to leave the gallery and for uh, new members to arrive. A short suspension. Well, it, it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thewlis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the jump of the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Liam MacArthur to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Back in February 2015, I led a similar debate uh, to this one on the future of Scotland's wave energy industry. 
At the time, we were reeling from the sudden demise of Palamis and aquamarine power and what appeared to be a crisis of confidence and even existential threat to the future of marine renewables. I took the opportunity to remind the Chamber during that debate of the many reasons to be proud of what we'd already achieved, including world firsts and world onlys, and confident about what could be achieved in the future. I called for bravery, vision and commitment from ministers and politicians north and south of the border. And that is a call I repeat here this afternoon at what Scottish Renewables has described as a critical juncture for the marine energy industry in this country. I'm very grateful to all those who signed my motion to allow this debate to take place and I'm particularly grateful uh, to colleagues who <coughs> spared the time to contribute to what I hope is a constructive and productive exchange of views. There are undoubtedly serious challenges facing the wave and tidal energy sectors and these uh, should not be underestimated. I will return to this shortly uh, and look at what might be done to mitigate or overcome those challenges. First though, I think it is helpful to remind ourselves of why development of marine renewables matters and why it matters that uh, we see it develop here in Scotland. Scotland, of course, has played a leading role in setting stretching climate change targets. This has been achieved on a cross-party basis and as new climate change legislation begins its journey through Parliament, I'm confident we'll see the same consensual but ambitious approach taken again. Any future targets will, of course, require the further decarbonisation of our energy system, while focus, quite rightly, will be on the areas of heat and transport, where too little progress has been made to date. We also have a way to go when it comes to generation. In that context, a mix of technology, including storage, will be needed, and I believe wave and tidal energy have an important role to play in that future energy mix, helping displace carbon generation from the grid. That belief stems from a view that we should be playing to our strengths, and marine renewables certainly does that. It plays to the strengths of our natural resources. Scotland is home to 25% of Europe's tidal stream and 10% of its wave resource. It plays to the strengths of our academic research base. Our universities are genuinely world-leading in the expertise they have developed over the years. For me, Heriot Watt University exemplifies this, and I say this as an uh, Edinburgh University graduate myself. A shameless plug here for the reception I will be hosting on the 3rd of October, uh, which will showcase Heriot Watt's interdisciplinary work on the blue economy, how we balance the different, sometimes competing uh, uses of our marine environment in sustainable ways. Through its Stromness uh, campus in Orkney, which hosts the International Centre for Island Technology, Heriot Watt has been in the vanguard on marine renewables and more recently taken a lead on how green energy systems are managed, including crucially the use to which that energy is put. All our universities though have contributed to our other great strengths, namely the skills and expertise within the supply chain. Again, ICT provides a perfect illustration of this, producing graduates at the forefront of Scott Renewables achievements, a company whose tidal stream turbine recently clocked up over three gigawatt hours of renewable electricity in the first year of testing at the European Marine Energy Centre. Indeed, EMEC itself is a further example of where Scotland and Orkney has taken a global, global lead in marine renewables, offering the means for developers to test their devices at scale and in a real-life environment. So these key strengths in research, supply chain and natural resources should give us cause for optimism. Optimism about realising our climate change ambitions. Optimism too about the potential job and uh, wealth-creating opportunities, not least through exporting products and services internationally. The offshore renewable energy catapult recently published a report underscoring this potential and reinforcing the fact that the economic benefits could and should be felt most significantly in coastal and island communities. Yet this optimism must be tempered by a recognition of the challenges facing both our wave and tidal industries. As Scottish Renewables point out in their briefing, there is currently an absence of policy certainty and viable routes to market for many wave and tidal technologies. In the case of wave energy, we have obviously seen a retreat back into the lab and a move away from funding for specific companies and arrays. Sensibly, Wave Energy Scotland is attempting to support R&D that will benefit all developers and avoid cost duplication of effort. This, though, serves to illustrate that we are talking about technologies that are still at the innovation phase. Even tidal energy projects, currently much further along the road in their development, fall into this category. Scottish Renewables argue that tidal stream is on the brink of developing from pre-commercial to fully commercial arrays, but cost reduction is still needed. 
And we need to see this reflected in the support made available, particularly from the UK government. I won't repeat the criticisms I and others have made uh, of the UK government's seeming ambivalence to renewables since 2015, in contrast to the strong support provided by my Liberal Democrat colleague Ed Davey during his period as Energy Secretary. However, inviting tidal stream projects to bid against offshore wind for contracts for difference makes no sense. Both may constitute marine renewable developments, but only in the broadest sense. A competitive mismatch on this scale simply risks uh, seeing tidal developments throttled at birth. A much better approach would be to challenge tidal and in due course wave developers to bid against other technologies, including storage, in an innovation category. This would also chime, I think, with the UK government's stated and welcome commitment in its industrial strategy to promoting innovation. Hopefully, I've managed to persuade uh, colleagues on the uh, Conservative ben benches about the merits of such an approach uh, and that we will, they will now agree to join in making representations to the UK government along those lines. From our previous discussions on this topic, I know the Minister shares this view, but I would also encourage him to look at what more the Scottish Government can be doing to incentivise innovation in ways that help bring the commercial deployment of marine renewables closer to reality. Deputy Presiding Officer, let me repeat what I said earlier. The development of marine renew renewables plays to our competitive strengths, our natural resources, our research and industrial skills, and the world lead we've already established. It provides an opportunity to create jobs and wealth in the course when it comes to wave and tidal energy. Thank you very much. We move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. Alexander Burnett to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and I'd like to thank Liam MacArthur for bringing this important topic to the debating chamber. And I note my members to my register of interest regarding renewable energy. Now, as we all know, renewable energy is the future. It is the way forward to protect our environment whilst enabling our society to continue. And the Scottish Conservatives recognise play in diversifying the energy mix, as well as the decarbonisation of energy. Now, we all agree that there must be a mix of technologies to meet Scotland's energy needs and climate change commitments. However, the Scottish Conservatives are keen to see an evidence-based approach to the mix of renewables across Scotland. And it's clear from the ORE Catapult report that the tidal stream industry brings many benefits to not only the job market in Scotland, but the wider UK economy also. So we support research and development in organisations involved in emerging renewable technologies, particularly tidal, to secure a viable route to market. And I'm sure that members across the chamber will agree that it needs to be done in a way that respects biodiversity and protects seabirds, marine mammals, fish and the marine environment. Now, despite the SNP government stating they wish to support marine and tidal energy, they have still not awarded a £10 million prize for innovation. I'm grateful to Mr Burnett for taking intervention. On the point of the Salter Prize, would, would the member accept that the withdrawal of the 100 megawatts of guaranteed CFD pot money for the marine energy sector has been one of the key factors as why no developer or no technology has managed to achieve commercial scale as yet and to satisfy the conditions of the Salter Prize? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, Alexander si Burnett. Si since 2010, the UK government has allocated over 90 million uh, grant funding to wave and tidal stream technology, so I don't think uh, we'll take lessons that we haven't, or, uh, that we haven't been supporting uh, the industry. But back to the Saltar Prize. You know, in 2008, 
the former First Minister, Alex Salmon, launched the Sultar Prize in a bid to drive marine energy to generate enough electrical output commercially for at least two years in Scottish waters. But to this day, this award has not been handed out, with no light at the end of the tunnel. The prize has been unable to attract a sufficient number of candidates, despite Nicola Sturgeon insisting on redrawing the criteria to redress this issue. In the meantime, two major competitors have gone bust. The scheme remains under review, with experts, civil servants and the industry in disagreement over relaunch and its cost. Now, with members of the expert committee overseeing the challenge, having to ask for up-to-date analysis of the marine energy industry to inform their deliberations, it is unclear why Nicola Sturgeon is not willing to find an outcome that benefits the sector rather than leaving it in limbo. Now, I know that my fellow member Liam MacArthur has spoken about this before, and we join him in his calls for the SNP government to either drop the prize or finally deliver for renewables. So the Scottish Conservatives remain committed to low carbon and the mix of renewables, but we're using an evidence-based approach that does not hinder any area of development. And we will continue to work with members across the chamber to ensure a greener energy system. Thank you. Are we all quiet now? <laughs> Have David Torrance followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Liam McCaffrey for bringing this motion to Parliament today and further raising the profile of tidal and wave energy and the benefits it has on our environment, our local economies and our wider national economy. I'd like to start by looking at the importance of these types of renewables to our future. Renewables are absolutely vital to us drastically reducing our carbon footprint and as, as we move away from using fossil fuels, tidal and wave energy are key to fulfilling and maintaining our nation's energy requirements. If we don't properly utilise the renewable sector that we have, then we will simply be unable to contain, continue to sustain the energy usage that we currently enjoy. Furthermore, in order for us to remain as world leaders in this sector, we must continue to invest in both research and development relating to wave and tidal energy and the construction of wave and tidal power stations. The Scottish Government has an outstanding record in delivering investment through the Wave Energy Scotland, which was requested to be formed in 2014 for the development of wave energy technology in Scotland. Conversely, whilst we in Scotland are investing, the UK Government are more focused on nuclear energy and in fact backtracking on investments that it promised in the tidal energy field. The UK Government has rejected plans for the Swansea Tidal Lagoon, which would have been the world's first tidal lagoon power station should it have went ahead. It would have preferred the UK to the top of the league in the world leading industry. We cannot leave it to the UK Government to take Scotland forward in tidal stream and wave energy industries. Now moving on to look at the economic impacts of investing in these renewables. According to a report by the Offshore Renewable Energy Capital, wave energy could contribute £4 billion to the UK economy and 8,100 jobs by 2040. And tidal energy could contribute £1.4 billion and 22,600 jobs. This is a cumulative total of 5.4 billion and 30,700 jobs that could be brought into the UK, particularly Scotland, Wales and the south-west of England, by preserving our environment and becoming a world leader. Scotland alone has 25% of all Europe's tidal resources. And if enough research and development was conducted, we could become a major world player in exporting green, clean energy and its valuable technology to a global market. But tidal fabrication of biofab, as is better known, which is based in my constituency, built the Oyster Wave Energy Converter, better known as Oyster 800 tidal device. This device was located in the European Marine Energy Centre in the Orkney Islands. EMEC is the first and only centre of its kind in the world to provide developers of both wave and tidal energy converters with a purpose-built, accredited open sea testing facility. EMEC is a not-for-profit company. To date, around 34 million has been invested by the Scottish Government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Carbon Trust, the UK Government, the Scottish Enterprise, the European Union and Orkney's Islands Council. This has ensured that Scotland retains a leading role in the development of marine energy and through this investment has been able to award 84 contracts and has been involved with over 177 separate organisations across 13 different countries. To conclude, President Officer, I would once again like to thank Lee McCaffer for securing this worthy debate. I hope to see tidal and wave energy sectors continue to grow from strength to strength as they will have an important part to play in the renewable sector 
and our targets of 100% of our electricity generation coming from the renewable sector. Call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much, and I too congratulate Liam MacArthur on uh, securing another debate on marine energy. His persistence is to his credit, and much the same could be said for many of those involved in the sector itself. And such persistence and optimism are well founded. They are based, first of all, on the far sighted decision back in 2003 to establish the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, with backing not just from Europe but also from ministers both here and at Westminster from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, as we have heard, and from Orkney Islands Council. EMEC did not so much address a market failure as represent a market intervention, seeking to stimulate a potential new energy industry in which Orkney and Scotland and the UK could aim to achieve first mover advantage. And so up to a, an, a, a point it has proved to be. As Scottish Renewables point out in their briefing this week, more wave and tidal devices have been developed in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland than in all the rest of the world put together. EMEC uh, takes a lot of credit for that enterprising approach. But it is only right to acknowledge that the last 15 years have seen ups and downs for marine energy. There have been false dawns and disappointments as well as exciting innovations and technological breakthroughs. Perhaps premature talk of a marine energy boom a decade ago did the sector no real favours, but the hard work has gone on nonetheless. Alexander Burnett mentioned Wattenfall, and just as marine energy innovation was getting underway in Orkney, a parallel development was taking place in the North East. The Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group got up and running in 2002, and it soon identified an offshore wind farm in Aberdeen Bay as one of its central, central ambitions. That seemed just as challenging at the time as achieving commercial viability for wave or tidal energy in Scotland's islands. After 15 years of hard work and ups and downs, it was great to see many veterans of AREG sail out of Aberdeen aboard a Northlink, Northlink ferry for the official opening of the Aberdeen Bay Wind Farm by Magnus Hall, the Chief Executive of Attenfall, and by the First Minister. That event proved that a vision for offshore renewable energy can be delivered if the commitment is there and the right commercial developer comes forward to invest in the right project at the right time. Aberdeen Bay now boasts the world's biggest wind turbines. Like EMEC, this project has benefited from support, financial or otherwise, from both local and national government and from Europe. Where Orkney boasts the European Marine Energy Centre, Aberdeen is now home to the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre. And in addition, there are innovative new technologies also being pioneered uh, off the coasts of both Buchan and Kincardineshire. The very success of offshore wind is, of course, part of the challenge for uh, wave and tidal energy. Wind developers have halved the costs of building uh, and installing turbines in recent years. That means, in spite of the good work in driving down costs that's already been achieved in wave and tidal, they have become relatively less competitive in the short term uh, uh, in spite of their best efforts. But Scottish Renewables also point out that an ancillary benefit of offshore wind deployment is a reduced cost of capital for the wave and tidal sector too. And it is precisely access to capital that is needed now for tidal energy in particular to move to the next phase. Liam MacArthur talked about UK government support needing to recognise that these are not yet commercially uh, mature technologies, and I think that's absolutely right. But tidal, water, tidal turbines are in the water producing power. Wave has lost some momentum in the last couple of years, but with the right technical uh, uh, progress can move forward uh, too. And like offshore wind in Aberdeen Bay, marine energy in Orkney and across Scotland has huge potential with continuing persistence and with backing from investors and from government at every level, it can deliver another step change for renewable energy. And if it does so, I think we'll be able to celebrate even more progress the next time we come to have this debate. Call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Jamie Halcro johnson Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Liam MacArthur for bringing forward this debate and for being one of the Parliament's key champions on renewable energy. Um, I first met him at a marine energy conference over a decade ago as I was heading out of the parliament and he was getting his feet under the table for the first time. And during the last decade, we've witnessed many ups and downs in the sector. Orcadian images of sea snakes and oysters and all manner of subsea turbines have graced our TV news programs. 
but the routes to market and full commercialization have often been plagued with financial risk and uncertainty caused largely by subsidy regimes that have failed to support our future energy needs. The opportunity still remains. Scotland still has one quarter of Europe's tidal resource and a tenth of its wave resource. That's not going anywhere, but the real prize as ever is to fuse the academic and industry expertise with great test beds and a pipeline of finance to take projects from small-scale arrays right the way through to fully commercialized technology. And the sector has struggled to get to commercialization because there is a circular problem here. Small projects struggle to attract finance because of the high fixed costs, and yet those small projects are the very ones needed to build the confidence to secure the financial support for the larger commercially viable projects. The story and the solutions are, of course, familiar. When the Burger Hill test wind turbines were spinning in Orkney in the 1980s, the Danish government stuck the best part of a billion pounds into the onshore wind sector and sucked most of the expertise into Denmark, where the turbine manufacturers could also sell their kit. Denmark was open for business while the UK was shut. Of course, it wasn't always like that with our industrial strategy. We used to be proud of our companies and were not afraid to put the best part of a billion pounds into Rolls-Royce in the 1970s, a move which enabled them to develop engines which went on to provide the backbone of a 7.4 billion pound global business. But private investors need to see leadership from government and certainty that policy is not going to change from year to year. The demise of the renewable obligation has been largely disastrous. Marine energy is unfairly being asked to compete with offshore wind technology, which is 20 years ahead, and has had the time to evolve and deliver substantial cost reduction. Now, our renewable energies, energies shouldn't be forced to compete with each other through contracts for difference, because we do need an energy mix that can develop over time, bringing in technologies that complement each other, harvesting different sources of renewable energy. And that's why the Westminster government must bring in a ring fence CFD for marine. Because yes, it is important to back the winners and the proven technology that's cost effective, but not to give up on an entire source of energy, which is just sitting there untapped in our oceans. And the prize is great. The BVG study for or catapult shows that 8,100 direct new jobs could be grown from our industrial heartlands in Fife right the way to the Northern Isles. And our great academic institutions such as St. Andrews and Harriet Watt Universities are playing a role and could play a greater role going forward as well, driving the research that can make this industry both cost-effective and environmentally benign. But these prizes are not won simply with the dead hand of the market at the tiller. It needs the leadership of a UK government prepared to work hand-in-hand -hand with the Scottish government and industry, albeit sadly without the financial support of European Union structural funds. The economic prize is great. The imperative of climate change and energy security is unavoidable. We must deliver the opportunity of a vibrant marine energy sector in Scotland. The last of the open debate contributions is from Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I remind members of my register of interests? Um, can I firstly congratulate my fellow Orcadian, Liam MacArthur, on securing today's members' debate on a subject which is of such importance to our islands, but also to my wider uh, Highlands and Islands region. We've already heard a number of very interesting and thoughtful contributions from around this chamber, uh, and as well as hearing some of the details of projects taking place in the waters of the Northern Isles. Just earlier this week, I had the pleasure of sitting on a panel um, at the Orkney uh, Renewable Energy Forum event in Stromness with Liam MacArthur and also Robert Leslie, who is representing the SNP, but uh, also works for Thor and Orkney Housing Association. And what became very clear was that not just the opportunities that present themselves in the islands, but also the enthusiasm of local people and the organizations, uh, organizations and the good work of bodies like EMEC. And uh, this was highlighted by calls from certainly some people there of actually energy tourism and, and renewables tourism as a potential way of, uh, of dealing with the, the interest in renewables from the island and also wider, uh, wider abroad too. But it's no secret that some of the sectors of the Highlands and Islands economy have waxed and waned um, over, across recent decades. And as we look at the growing renewable energy industry uh, in the region uh, with both a sense of pride at its current success, we also have to look with a, hope of, a sense of hope for the future. What we now speak of in terms of projects um, have the potential to be in the industrial successes of the future, providing the clean and renewable energy to support our economy. And it's particularly, uh, welcome particularly that the UK industrial strategy identified one of our main national priorities as clean growth. This was expanded on through the UK government's recent clean growth strategy. 
Clean and sustainable economic growth will be of increasing international importance as countries around the world look towards addressing their international commitments uh, on climate change and decarbonisation. So Scotland having a leading role in the development of emergent technologies can have the benefits felt around the world while securing our own domestic energy supply at home. However, while, we consi while considering the global context, there's a very much more local dimension that is keenly felt in communities like the, Highland, uh, like the Northern Isles. One area of repeated concern is how renewables benefit local supply chains and provide a long-term basis for training and skills development within the communities they're deployed in. Many members will have heard complaints about the need to import materials and expertise in the wind energy sector. New technologies, however, are an opportunity to get things right, and I think that was, follows on from what Mark Ruskell was talking about. There are benefits, not just the immediate creation of jobs, but in building a labour market skilled in technology-based professions. There are also undoubtedly local challenges to be overcome. In Scotland, these are primarily geographical. Transmission remains an issue and is, for quite apparent reasons, felt most keenly on the islands. We know that Ofgem is currently examining the needs case for a new Orkney interconnector, which has the potential to provide an enormous boost to the industry local, locally. And overcoming these barriers to success is rightly an area where governments should cooperate, and the ability of the UK and Scottish governments, as well as local authorities, to work together will be vital in making real progress. It's also positive to reflect on some of the achievements of the energy sector itself. In recent years, we have seen a considerable drop, uh, drop in, the cost of the, um, in the cost of the number of renewable technologies as they move from being emergent to established. As a result, we see clean energy that can compete on price, lowering costs for businesses and individuals. The motion before us today mentions some of the UK-level policy decisions around tidal energy. I understand that in the interests of Orkney have a good level of interaction with the UK government ministers, both in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the, and the Scottish Office. In fact, both ministers, I think, recently visited Orkney. There has, of course, been real progress um, on island onshore wind and a renewed uh, focus on new offshore wind as part of the industrial strategy. In many cases, renewable technologies are demonstrating the sort of innovation that we want to see across the industry, industry and that should be encouraged and supported. Here in Scotland, we have a range of pioneering examples of projects that have a record of development, collaboration and delivery, all while providing benefits to their communities and to the wider economy. Deputy Presiding Officer, these attributes will undoubtedly be key to building up Scotland as a global centre for renewables in years to come, and that my region, the Highlands and Islands, and my home county of Orkney in particular, continue to play a leading role in developing and making renewables of the future. I call Paul Wheelhouse to respond to the debate on behalf of the government. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, I too, like others, want to thank Liam MacArthur for securing this debate and indeed for the wider members of the Chamber for contributions this lunchtime. I share Liam MacArthur's view that a strong, decisive message being sent to UK ministers and indeed to the sector to show our support for the sector is a very welcome uh, outcome from today's debate. There is, of course, a long history uh, of support for marine energy in the Scottish Parliament, and of course I would argue that the Scottish Government, as uh, David Torrance argued, has a strong track record of support for the sector, uh, while support has perhaps not been so robust elsewhere. We are a maritime nation, and much of Scotland's influence on the world is built on our scientific and engineering heritage. And one of the ways that legacy continues is through our approach to the technologies that will power this century and indeed beyond. So, as others have indicated, today Scotland is home to the world's uh, leading wave and tidal test centre, the European Marine Energy Centre, and Mr MacArthur's uh, beautiful constituency, where more devices are being tested than anywhere else in the world, and, and, and Lewis MacDonald is absolutely right about that. And indeed, the world's largest tidal array, uh, the Mayjen array, uh, in the Pentland Firth, is, um, ultimately may expand to up to close to 400 megawatts in scale, and, and scale is a key issue that we'll turn to later. And we have to date invested ourselves, as Scottish Government, £23 million uh, in, in that project to get it to the stage it's at. The world's most powerful 2 megawatt tidal stream turbine, Scott Renewables SR2000 device, is a point of pride, as has been said by Lou MacArthur, has generated uh, 3 gigawatt hours of um, energy so far. The world's largest wave energy technology programme, Wave Energy Scotland, which has to date funded 84 projects and invested £30 million of public support and involving 177 
organization. So these are all great successes. These achievements and others can be attributed in no small part to the consistent and committed support from the Scottish Government and our enterprise agencies, but most of all to the passion, expertise, investment and innovation of this young industry, which I believe we all share the view has such huge potential domestically and indeed in export markets. But despite these successes, the path to commercialization and uh, remains, remains a key challenge for the marine energy industry, despite the clear potential of the industry to generate economic growth. The challenge of building a large-scale homegrown success story has, needlessly in my view, been made more difficult by the UK Government's decision to remove a ring-fence subsidy for marine energy. And we do need to be clear about this. The former Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, did promise a ring-fenced uh, 100 megawatts of CFD funding for marine energy, and that was uh, unfortunately reneged on uh, when there was a change of Prime Minister and Theresa May's Government came in. Uh, that was removed in December of 2016. We know that the UK, and Scotland in particular, has world-leading strengths in wave tidal energy, and Lee MacArthur encapsulated very well uh, the three issues, the academic base, the natural resource, and the supply chain that we already have. And I know there are a number of hundreds of jobs in, in Orkney Islands that already depend on the R&D activity around uh, marine energy. We know there's a global demand for these technologies too, particularly if you think the opportunities in small island states and areas such as the uh, Indonesian archipelago, Philippines, where this would be an ideal technology to deliver sustainable energy for island communities and indeed at home in our islands. And as the offshore renewable energy catapult has demonstrated clearly, and this was referenced by David Torrance and other members, there is great potential for cost reduction and scale is critical here because Lewis MacDonald mentioned offshore wind and he is quite right. The capital cost is halved of investment in offshore wind and the levelised cost has come down substantially. That has been achieved through manufacturing economies of scale and increasingly large turbines, yes, of course, but also manufacturing volumes going up, as we've seen with solar and onshore wind as well. And we need to get commercial scale projects in wave and tidal energy to make that happen here too. But as David Torrance and others have indicated, you know, significant uh, job numbers uh, potentially by 2040, certainly 8,100, the catapult has, uh, has estimated uh, for 2040 in the wave energy sector and uh, potentially uh, 4,000 in the tidal stream sector by 2030, 10 years earlier. But what the sector needs now is a route to market to enable commercial scale projects such as the later phases of May Gen 2 built, built out. As Bayes was unwilling to do so, I have convened senior stakeholders from across the wave and tidal sectors, as well as the relevant Scottish, UK and European trade associations, to consider this issue. And the key aim of the Scottish Government's Scottish Marine Energy Industry Working Group, which is referenced in Mr MacArthur's motion, is to ensure that the sector speaks with one voice, presents a consistent message about its impressive achievements to date, its value to the energy system, uh, the environment and the economy, and the support it needs to achieve its full potential. That group is now halfway through the program, uh, scheduled programme of meetings, but I'll make clear if it's re still required, happy to keep that group going beyond uh, the scheduled uh, length of, of its duration. But the group has discussed recent developments and concerns across the sector with a particular focus on finance issues and uh, important parallels with the offshore wind sector that Lewis MacDonald refer referenced and our oil and gas sectors in the way that the supply chain operates and the work underway to develop the revenue support case and cost reduction pathway that Mr MacArthur calls for in his motion. I look forward to working... I, I certainly will. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. I also should probably uh, declare my interest um, as a, in receipt of uh, feed-in tariffs uh, and uh, RHI support. But in relation to that financial support he's talking about, I know he shares the, the view that uh, an innovation pot uh, in terms of providing finance may be a route forward. Is he, can he update the Parliament on any discussions he's had with UK ministers about that proposal? Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, President. So we certainly are, are keen to support innovation. As I say, we are directly funding already a number of projects, whether through Wave Energy Scotland or uh, directly in the case of, of Amagen and uh, support for other uh, important companies like Nova Innovation who have developed uh, uh, the Blue Mill Sound Array. We will continue to engage in this. It is indeed one of the issues that uh, is going to feature in the discussions of the working group around how we can support the industry. We are restricted in how we can directly support the generation of power itself. So 
uh, Liam MacArthur is quite right, innovation is one of the areas where the Scottish Government can support uh, technology and looking for integrated projects through the Low Carbon Innovation Fund and other routes we can try and see if we can make more use of the Government's um, leverage in terms of R&D to support the sector. But I do look forward to working with the group uh, in the coming months given the very useful dialogue we've had to date. I will respond to, to some of the comments um, made in the excellent debate we've had today, uh, if I may, Presiding Officer, certainly um, in regards to the points that were made um, early on uh, by Mr Burnett. Um, I do I take his point about Salter Prize. We are all disappointed that has not been yet been awarded, but I would ask him to reflect on the point that uh, the withdrawal of the 100 megawatts of CFD minima has had a, a key role to play in preventing projects getting to that commercial scale and therefore capitalising on the Salter Prize. I do believe that um, that's something that hopefully we can we can share as an aspiration. Uh, Lewis McDonald referenced the, val the, the ups and downs of the industry. is quite right. There have been a number of those. There are clearly in any new technology is a valley of death phenomenon. And what we need is to have some light of the tunnel, mixing my metaphors here, have an opportunity for commercial scale development so that de in technologists can see that there is an opportunity, having gone through that early stage pre-commercial phase, that there is a commercial route for them. And that is what is lacking at the moment. And indeed, we can learn a lot from the development of offshore wind. Unfortunately, as Mark Ruskell very importantly referenced, we do, not yet, we do no longer have access to rocks and the ability for Scottish ministers to have rocks which re reference the innovative nature of the technology and that is a matter of great regret and we continue to press UK government to provide recognition of the innovative nature of these technologies and to provide them with the support. Uh, I would just like to say a little bit, if I may, um, I've overstayed my welcome in terms of the amount of time, presiding officer, so I'll just move to conclude if that would be acceptable to you. Just to reference members to see the number of references in the energy strategy to the deployment of marine energy. But in closing, I'd just like to say that we have made many achievements in terms of Scotland's pioneering wave and tidal sectors. I would like to close by mentioning just a few, if I may briefly, presiding officer, developments which are relevant to the discussion we've had. Firstly, the EU-funded NESI programme, uh, nothing to do with the monster in Loch Ness. Uh, but everything to do with North Sea Solutions for Corrosion and Energy, um, completed a call for applications recently and three companies were successful in the call, Symic, Atlantis, uh, EMEC and SSE. Now, SE aims to produce business cases for demonstration projects in the North Sea and a detailed value chain for corrosion across the parts, to, again, to look at the life cycle costs and keep the costs down. Scottish Enterprise has now proved funding for Scottish partners in the last of six transnational projects selected by Ocean Energy Euronet co-fund. Um, the total SE grant for the six projects, don't worry, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, office there, I will pass this note to you. Um, but the total SE grant for six projects is 2.8 million. The total R&D spend, including companies and other funding organisations for these projects, will be around 15 million euros. And projects will start during uh, the course of this month. And finally, uh, presiding officer, I'm delighted that Edinburgh is hosting the sixth Ocean Energy Europe conference on the 30th and 31st of October. Having addressed the fifth conference in Nantes, I know this is a prestigious and growing international event which reflects the strong interest internationally in the sector. This is therefore an excellent opportunity to showcase Scotland's marine energy strengths, ambition and appetite to collaborate with our international partners. And I look forward to welcoming delegates to Edinburgh and would ask all here that you look to support the promotion of Scotland's marine achievements during the course of the two-day event. And I would just say to UK ministers who may be watching, it would be a great opportunity to announce some stronger support for what is potentially a hugely significant sector, not just for Scotland, but indeed the world. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and the meeting is suspended until 2.30 p.m. Well, it, it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thulis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. 
The UK government have never been able to justify this policy, and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women, and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. <laughs>